going to be Len from uh, Guardian Gas Services. Um, but just before we jump in, I was just going to promote the new Your Home Technical Manual. You may have seen the blue covered one. This is a new edition. It's about twice as thick. Fantastic read if you're uh, into anything about sustainable. Lots of uh, pictures and it's just been <coughs> updated. So uh, the old one's getting a bit dated. This one's a lot better. 35 bucks on the website, ata.org.au. Have a the sale pitch. And there's two in the library. If you're a member, you can borrow it, but I believe there's a long waiting list already. So um, I'll hand oh, over to Len. Len's going to tell us about Hydronic and um, how it works in SA. I've never done anything like this before, never been nervous, so hope you give me a little bit of a break. Um, but I'm here to talk about hydraulic heating. I've worked in the industry for 38 years, uh, been in South Australia now for 11. Uh, I've got a gas contractors for license, and also I'm a licensed gas Here we go. So, what we're going to cover tonight, what is meant by hydraulic heating, some of the benefits, the types of heat sources. A little bit on hydraulic cooling, um, retrofitting systems in existing homes, and a little bit on maintenance. I was asked to cover problems, but I don't think there are any problems. I've cut that out. <laughs> Look, uh, a hydraulic heating system uses water to move thermal energy from a heat source to a heat emitter. And the heat sources can be the pumps. Air source, your diesel boilers, your natural gas or LPG, and your solar via a tank, combustion stoves, wood gasification, anything like that. They go via a distribution network of pipes to the heat emitters. This is the board that travels through the water to the heat emitters. Heat emitters can be the radiant floor system, it can be panel radiators. Ceiling radiant systems, wall radiant systems, could be convectors. There are a number of different ways we can emit that heat into the room that we're trying to heat. So, yeah, it's sort of unlimited, really. There, there, there's thousands, there's that. But they're the basics. This is a basic system. We've got our heat source here with the energy input. We've got our distribution system, our distribution pipe work. There's a circulator, which is part of that <coughs> system. And we've got our heat emitters again. They could be the rain or powering radiators. The thermal energy is absorbed by the water, a heat source, and it's circulated around the system. We use water because it's clean, it's readily available, it's non toxic, it's non flammable. And it also has a very high heat storage capacity. So we can move a lot of heat around the water. <coughs> if you've got any questions while I'm going along, just just <coughs> that, you may forget and it may be a bit easier. <laughs> Some of the benefits of comfort, energy savings, design flexibility. We can we can get pipe work where duct work can't go. Duct work's really large, we can get the pipe work in very uh, small areas. It's clean in its operation, it's quiet. The boilers are very quiet, the heat pumps are very quiet, a bit below 50 decibels, and it's a non-invasive installation. We'll go into that in a little bit. <coughs> retaining comfort is just a matter, not a matter of supplying heat to a body, it's a matter of controlling how that body loses heat. Now if we can, if we can get the walls and the surfaces of, a, of an area almost the same temperature as the room, we don't lose heat very quickly. When heat is allowed to leave the body at the same rate as it is produced, we feel comfortable. If the walls and the windows are cold, we lose heat quickly. So what we're trying to achieve is we're trying to maintain how we lose that heat. And I think the heat is very good for that because most of the yeah, so we have radiant floors and radiant walls. So that heat transfer is reduced. If we've got a differential in temperature between our body and the wall, the larger that differential in temperature, the quicker we lose heat. So if we can heat those walls and we can heat the floors, 
not to any great degree. You'd be probably surprised that the floor is actually cooler than our bodies. So we're actually losing heat. Although the floor feels warm, we're actually losing heat to that floor. So we just trying to control how we lose, lose heat. And radiant heating is very good for this, rather than blown air. And adult engaging light activities actually lose, generates about 120 watts of heat per hour. And if you look at the way we lose most of our heat, essentially through radiation. So we radiate most of our heat chemicals. <coughs> <laughs> Properly designed hydraulic systems control both the air and the surface temperature of the room. We don't just, radiant systems don't just warm the air. Convectors, a radiant panel is a convector and a radiant heater. It will convect heat as well as radiate heat out of the panel. And a radiant floor system will also convect heat off the floor. <coughs> So it doesn't just warm the air, it warms the, 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 the surface of the air. Modern controls can maintain those temperatures within a few degrees of the set point. The main uh, qualities of hydraulic heating, the fact that we can, we can zone these systems, we can control each room individually. A, a single radiator can be controlled by a single thermostat. We have single thermostatic radiator valve. <coughs> so we can control every room in the house individually. We can control each circuit individually. So the, the one, uh, one of the great advantages of heating is that, that controllability. We can control it to the point where we can, if the outside temperature drops, we can reduce the water temperature into the room. So therefore, we're saving energy. And it's that controllability that I think that actually lifts hydraulic heating above ductive heating. Yeah, ductive heating can be zoned, but not to this extent. Oh, you yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Good. So, if you've got two storey plates, slab, concrete slab, <laughs> timber floors, upstairs, how do you, how do, you do it? We said you can put radiant floor downstairs, you can put radiant uh, panels upstairs, you can put radiant floor in both upstairs and downstairs. Ah, <coughs> so, yeah, I was thinking of the uh, slab, heating in the slab. Okay, can you do anything in the timber floor or just have to do radiant panels? No, we can put, we can put uh, radiant floor heating under timber floors. It does work under timber floors, it works quite well. There are products now that, that fit under timber floors that actually uh, touch the timber, so the radiant heat comes through the wood. Wood does act as an insulator to some extent, but it will still permeate the wood, and you will step. Will it? You have to probably increase the temperature of the water slightly, but it does work quite well. <coughs> you said yeah, different thermostatic valves for different rooms, different temperatures. Mm -hmm. In Northern Europe, they leave the windows open at minus 26 degrees. Why the hell do you heat bedrooms here? <laughs> we're not European. <laughs> <laughs> we're different. <coughs> Stop showing us up. <laughs> so, does that mean you still have the one boiler, even though you've got two controlling the same temperature? Yeah. So, is that just controlled through basically closing them down to make sure that part drops? With, with, in the, um, with the panel radiator, for instance. That panel radiator can have a thermostatic valve attached to it. On that thermostatic valve, they have a graduation. There are numbers. Each one of those numbers corresponds to a temperature. Now, if you set, for instance, it on three, uh, the, the, the valve on three, when, that, when the temperature in that room reaches the corresponding temperature to three, say 20 degrees, it will shut that radiator off. Just that radiator. So they're used for bedrooms, for instance, when you want the bedrooms a little cooler. They turn the range down to 18, and, and the living room's a little bit higher. You can do that with radiated uh, panel radiators, but with radiant floor heating, it's controlled via a manifold. A thermostat senses the heat in the room. That operates an actuator of the manifold, and that shuts off the circuit that corresponds to that, that thermostat. Does that make sense? Yeah. If, if you're um, under the wall, so I think that 
um, as an easy thing, volume two. Yeah, it's a polyethylene glass volume one, two, and it has an oxygen barrier. The oxygen barrier is to prevent oxygen entering the fiber yeah. and entering the, the water because the oxygen will create problems. Uh, the air gets into a fiber and it creates problems. You don't want to eliminate that. It also corrodes. So, oh, so that's just, yeah. So, here's a really quick question for you. It's like why I can't do it, but it's worrying me for years. Um, I love this. What happens if you get a neuron free? Would I drill it through the slab? It can be repaired. Yeah. So, yeah. what would be the condition? You know, what would be stage one if that happened? Well, be? stage one, the system would shut down because the system <coughs> you see it. It depressurized. Yeah, it would depressurize the boilers and the heat pumps all have pressure sensitive uh, controls. Yeah, yeah. So if the pressure drops in the pipework, it shuts off the system. Yeah. That alerts you to the, to the problem. Yeah. You then call out myself or the secure installers at the back there. Yeah. We come out, we look at the system, and we go, yeah, you've got the, the problems with the pipe. So then we have to cut away a bit of concrete, yeah. repair the pipe, <coughs> and we go. So your spacing between pipes is more than sufficient for you to be able to cut there. Oh, yeah. Without yeah. having any further pipe. That trace is there. Yeah, it's not getting there. Yeah, yeah just, you know, the coils are too closely together. Yeah, it just seems like they're up and down. No, no, it, it's quite easily done. And coiling is usually 200 millimeters, uh, a space 200 millimeters. Yeah, so it's, quite but it's really down to the individual house or room. Yeah. If, if, if we're coiling, for instance, by a window, the spacing is tight enough to provide the heat back. But generally, they're 200 millimeters. We used to have a rehab tool that was really easy to get, <coughs> but rehab changed the tool. So now it's really difficult for the tool to get in there. But it was like a, a prong tool, and we just yeah, put yeah. a bit in there. Yeah, it's a pre calibrated yeah. What's the effect on your underscore heating description in storage with the growing well, timber? I mean, we were coming up to 12%, 40% moisture. Is that all right? You can put your heating in the floor. It's not too bad. Generally, we sort of rely on um, timber experts, people who are going to lay the timber for that sort of advice. Uh, it varies between timber merchants or timber installers. I guess most of it will have to be seasoned. So you're talking about old season, retrofitting here, probably just putting new in. No, you might get a straight on the You can read it in the fire room if you need to, that's one of your major problems. Like in your you know, air conditioning, uh, too low a humidity is a problem for us. So you actually. Air conditioning drives the air out again. Yeah, mm -hmm. so. Or the strip, you can shrink or whatever. You can strip, or the strip, shrink on it. I guess one of the best things for him has that same effect of the building of the place that may be in the oil at a different moisture level. So you're talking about retrofitting under floor heating under under a timber floor. Yeah. yeah. Not coming across that, but I can't think it would be too major. We're talking about very low temperatures. We're only talking gray it's sort of forty degrees. Yeah. yeah. I don't think we have we, we have too much it's but it's a lot, <coughs> the temperature is a lot lower than the sun coming through the window, for instance. So um, I don't think we'd have too much problem, but again, timber manufacturers and suppliers might be able to help you with that one. Here's an example of a. I need this opportunity to my daughter, so I have to put that one in. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> of an underfloor system that's actually heating the wall. So you can see the heat from the underfloor actually warming the wall. It's my photo. Sorry? It's my photo. Oh, is it? <laughs> I must have your money for it. <laughs> so this is an example of how radium floor heating actually heats the wall as well, yeah. and, and therefore, um, you know, it, 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 you're getting an overall um, heating system, not just a floor heating system. It's actually like is that a concrete floor? I don't know. It's a slightly different floor heating, but I would imagine it's a concrete floor heating. I, th I would have thought it's a slab. <coughs> Right, you didn't ask me about it, mate. Studies have shown that with forced air systems, air leakage rates 
20 to 60% higher in energy usage and average 40% higher in rooms, in homes with hydraulic heat. Now, the consensus of opinion, if you've got a forced air system, you've got a ducted gas system or a, a reverse cycle ducted system, that it pressurizes the room. And in doing so, it forces air out of the badly built building we live in. Because of that, air has to be replaced. So cold air gets created that heat. So therefore, you're paying for heat to go out the windows and you're reheating the cold air coming back in. These are studies that have been carried out by ASHRAE, the American Society of Heating Engineers. And I got it from their, uh, one of their manuals. So it's not going to happen everywhere. If you've got a really nicely built home and a really well developed or a designed ducted system, may not get, you would get this stuff. But it's possible that if you're pressurizing a house, it's going to force air out of the gaps. Uh, that makes sense to me. And if that air goes out, then air's got to be replaced. And that air's got to be cold. Most of us are not doing that now. <coughs> Instead of having to pressurize one ducted system, mm -hmm. you put three or four little air conditioners around the house where the people are switch on. Yeah, yeah. You it saves a lot of energy. Yeah, I mean, that's the way you could do it. Uh, that's why they have balancing flues now. The what, sorry? That's why they have balancing flues. That doesn't count. That just doesn't weigh. Does it work now? Sorry? It does, it, it's better now with balancing flues? I absolutely. They've been using them in Europe for 20 years. And do they use them here? Uh, yeah, they do. Okay. Yeah, low power systems. That's one of the reasons why they. they this is the, the radiant floor and radiant heating people looking at how hydronics more beneficial than. The ability to zone systems, and I touched on that earlier. The, the, the fact that we can we can control each individual room or each individual circuit actually reduces uh, our running costs. Because we can it's set rooms that we're not going to use very often uh, at lower temperatures. Outdoor weather reset controls. When we design a system, we design it at set points. And those set points for the panel radiators demand a flow temperature of say 70 degrees. So if our set point is 5 degrees outside and we want to achieve 20 degrees <coughs> inside, our flow temperature to the radiator should be around 70 degrees. But that radiator will put out the amount of heat that is described in the manufacturer's workers. If, for instance, the weather outside is not 5 degrees, it's 10 degrees, we don't need 70 degree water now because we're not losing as much heat as we get at 5 degrees. So, outdoor weather reset compensates for this. It realizes the outside weather is now 10 degrees. It realizes the inside is still wanting to be 20 degrees, but it says we don't need 10 degree water, we only need 50 degrees. So, it reduces the flow temperature into the house. And so that increases our energy. Insulated distribution pipes and low flow temperatures for underfloor instance. That also reduces heat loss. It's a diagram coming up in the future when we can go into it more. Hydronic heating systems are less unconstructed gas. If you've got a ducted air system, most of the hot air lays at the top of the house, at the top of the house. Hydronic heating systems, especially the regular floor, the warm air is down below. Uh, I think we've got a slide here. So this is an example. This is the so called ideal temperature profile. For a, a room. If you look at the underfloor heating, it's almost identical to the ideal profile. But right over this end, we've got ceiling heating. And we've also got this is forced air. But you can see the forced air comes out of the duct or the, the opening in the room and the ceiling at much higher temperatures than 24 degrees. But by the time you get to the bottom there, it's quite cool. Mm -hmm. Our feet are quite cool, but our heads are quite hot. And again, um, radiators are actually not too far off. It's only up there. You get quite a bit of hot air up the top, and quite a bit of cool air down the bottom. And it's got a radiator there. So we can see that underfloor heating almost matches the ideal um, profile. It's been determined by someone. 
So that profile is based on the window example or on the, that the outside wall has a larger thermal mass and therefore is a better stable? Yeah, that, you see the, the wall will actually uh, get radiated heat from the radiator so it will get a better thermal mass and you, you, they will heat up. I went to a winery um, well, a couple of weeks ago, with my, I've got a thermal camera, a thermal imaging camera and the guy had a, um, one of these little uh, sort of barbecue uh, patio heaters and he put it in the mine in this um, cellar door to, to warm it up the day before. And it, the day after I went there and I was looking for some pipe work for him because he wanted to drill a hole. But I put it on the wall and you could still see a glow on the wall from the day before. So yeah, walls do uh, pick up radiant heat. Well, the other thing is the, the practice in, in England was to put uh, reflective foils in behind on the outside wall, which sort of counteracts that slightly. Yeah. There, there was a uh, there was a period in time when they did do that. Yeah, they put reflective, and in, to try and to reflect the heat back into the room. But basically, you're right. What you're saying, you want to try and get that heat into that mass of the floor. Um, but we all learn by mistakes. And it, it went through England for a little while. But then the other thing is, you're you're heating up an external wall. Um, surely that increases your heat loss to the outside yeah. world. Yeah. Now we've got different temperatures. You know, you've got a, a greater temperature on the inside and, and the outside. So we're going to get uh, more transfer of heat through because those temperatures are, have increased. So there's all these things to take into consideration when you're designing this. Yeah, maybe move it onto the inside wall. Maybe you know make that wall capable of absorbing all this radiant heat. Well, this is the other thing. Like the houses over there have solid brick internal walls. Whereas mm -hmm. our, most most yeah, of ours are brick. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, if we yeah, had a, a thermal mass wall inside, that would be obviously the same profile. Without a lot of the negatives. Yeah, most of this stuff comes out of the studies. Uh, this is a European uh, example, but most of uh, the profiles come out of the states. But you're right, if you've got a jib block wall, you're not going to have that thermal mass. The radiator is not going to be able to heat it very easily, and therefore it's not going to be as effective as it is on a brick wall. Your second graph is perplexing because surely over time that graph would change. When you start the system up, that's the sort of gradient you will see. Yeah. But after a certain time, you did home your spaces. 
and the temperature range would be quite different as shown to that. You're probably right. I'll have to get on them. There's a very simple answer to all of this. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, put the heating in your home on full, get a very cold night, go outside and either hire a thermal imaging unit, right, or hire someone who has one, right, and image the property from outside. Okay, then address the same thing within the budget. It's a bit hard to hear, did you say put a jumper on? Or upwards. The design flexibility of the system is virtually unlimited. A single system can be designed to provide space heating, domestic hot water, and cooling. We can use a single boiler to do all these yes. things. Or we put a heat exchanger in so we can run pulp heating so the chemicals don't mix into the system. And we can have hot water off it. Um, we can do that with any kind of appliance. And we can also provide space heating, which is again on the floor in wall. Multi-level systems like that save installation costs. You don't need a hot water heater, don't need a continuous flow of hot water heater. You don't need a separate pool heater. It reduces the amount of pipe work you need for gas. Um, we have very little movement of air with radiant hydraulic system. We take this and do move air. air. Install them in England. We used to cut the notches out of the, out of the joists and then we put little bits of felt in. <laughs> Sometimes we never put the felt in, and they would squeak and creak. The pipes is out. <coughs> but now we use plastic pipes and polyethylene pipes, and they're very quiet. The boilers are very quiet. And here, unlike in England, they're outside, so you can't hear them at all. But in the UK, we have them in our kitchen. And, and <laughs> some of them. Well, some of the old The radiators go with it too. You hear the pipes. Right. The new model systems, the new vaccine boilers that are out now, actually run variable speed circulating pipes. So does the demand on the system introduced as the valves close down, the actuators and everything close down. We used to get some uh, velocity noise, we used to get some pipe break noises, the pumps continued to run at the set speed. Now the new modern boilers. Variable speed pumps. So as, as, that, uh, as it's reduced, the demand on the system is reduced, the pump actually winds down. <coughs> the velocity of the speed pump. What's the pressure? Sorry? What's the pressure? What the pressure? The static pressure in the system is about half. Most of the boilers, the, uh, the natural gas boilers, and the steel system boilers have a pressure switch that cuts off the whole of half. So, so that's half the pump and one half the pump. Yeah. It's good for home theatre rooms because it's very quiet, there's no plumbing air, there's no noise, there's no plumbing air, so you can sit and watch movies uh, or do your studies if you need and it's nice and quiet, there's no, no background noise. Now, uh, this is the example. Okay. We can move as much heat energy through a three quarter inch pipe as a 14 by 8. Heat loss calculated per uh, meter uh, along that duct's length 
is 119 watts per hour. When the duct temperature is 54 degrees in the sky, the water temperature is 44 degrees at the roof, and in the roof is 12 degrees. Similar example there, we only use 12 watts per hour for an installed pump. So your system is really going to regulate the solar as well, the run children as well? Yeah, you can. There's a little bit of cooling in the thing. It takes up far less space, so as you can see, we can, we can shut it more energy down that. Than we can down that way. So you can put these in space. Architects, I guess, design houses around that way. Um, there's a house, I mean, he and I did this one up. It was open on the sustainable house day last year, I believe. And they had to make a boxing to get the pipe, the, the duct work down to the ground floor. You really don't have to do it. No. You can see it easier. And it's easier to regulate. I mean, you can use it Right, heat sources. Natural gas. So if the installation plan sources. So in terms of more uh, concrete slab, do you recommend the telephone slab a single floor or double floors or something? I think we recommend, uh, and this is something most of the world is a second. I think you've got to try to get away from the second floor because that gives a concrete uh, manufacturer the concrete that installs the idea to charge it two sides. Mm -hmm. it, it's basically a screen, it, it's not another concrete slab. You're also talking about smaller thermal mass, which I think suits our environment a fine here better. It's something we, we need a larger thermal mass in Europe, and obviously it's possible for most of Winter, but here we get very nice warm days for cool mornings and cool evenings. So we don't really want to heat up a massive slab and then have a emitted heat of that out. In the UK, we used to have. Um, we really do Yes. Yeah. So would you check? I don't know how many times you get out, but maybe four or five degrees, but would that change the response? Are we talking about 10, 20 degrees difference? That would be probably. No, no, you, no you, you, the, the, the hills are fine. You, 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 yeah. In, any insulation you put underneath the heat at the pumps is going to benefit because you will lose heat in the rest. It could be quite large. What about insulating underneath the whole slab before the slab gets poured? I think people have tried that, and I think the concrete guys don't shy away from it, and the engineers will probably shy away from it. We've done our system, me and I did a system in Arndor, but they Put it on waffle pot. Yeah. And that, that apparently worked very well. Okay. Yeah, because waffle pot is used to take it. Yeah. Uh, but that apparently worked really well. But yeah, if you could put insulation first, put your slab down, put your insulation on the next screen on top, that's fine. Yeah. Back in England, we used to have a thing called a. It was a heater with a big concrete block in it, and it was electric. Yeah. And overnight, yeah. storage. Yeah. For storage yeah. heaters. Yeah. 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 And we used to heat it up overnight, and then the next day was hot. And the thing was pumping out heat and that's why they had the windows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 A lot so of houses. What the plane is if you're considering heating the energy to get slightly remote plane, what when is that going to start running the heating to reset? Or would you run it continuously? <coughs> yeah, you, I think if you put it in the slab, you tend to run it continuously. And I think that's one of the problems with this climate that I've learned over the 11 years of being here, that it's it's different here. So we have to adapt. And I think making a thinner slab is better because we get we get, do get cold sort of autumns and, and sort of not now, but we do get cold uh, springs. And it's nice to be able to turn it on in the day and have it emitting heat sort of in the evening. The answer to that under floor insulation, or before you pour your concrete slab, is to have a very deep raft construction engineer and a thin slab on top. So you've got the rigidity of a raft structure, and to keep those inside hollows, keep the concrete away, they use polystyrene blocks, huge ones, which of course insulate. There was a company starting up, and we saw it at one of the shows, did we, Steve, when they were going to make like a polystyrene pool pool, sort of a yeah, bonded area, in about. effect, and they were going to pour the concrete into it. That's what I'm talking about. I don't know if they ever got off the ground, but I think they were checking this in back in the car. No. I never saw it again. When you're laying your tubing on the slab, do you put it into the window? No. Just screening the rest? 
Oh, in the slab or on the slab? Uh, do you do anything for it to be If it's an in the slab on the gradient, yeah. no, we generally just apply it to the mesh. Yeah. Oh, if it's an yeah. on the slab, yeah. yes, it goes on. There's, there's various products. There's a product that we have made called Takashi, and that's a 25 mm thick polystyrene, yeah. and that goes on the slab. The pipe work is then stapled to that and then is sprayed away. So then the top panel is on top. And there are different products out there that are the one that's used the most. But different heat sources. This is by no means exhausted. There's something that comes in. Right, natural gas oil is LPG. They're probably the cheapest to buy in the store. They can also provide continuous domestic hot water flow. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. We can both, we can get this, we can do both the natural gas and the For the same reason to the Yeah, now on the backs, it will actually, if you hook up uh, natural gas to the backs and then suddenly change it to LPG, the backs will recognize that. Okay. And it will adapt. And it also, without rejection. Without rejection. It adapts and that's it. it also monitors its combustion performance all the time and it adjusts its fan speed and its gas pressure. They're very efficient, especially with the condensing models. They're around about 92 percent efficiency and the non condensing models are around about 78. Got flexible installation options. That's an outdoor model. On the right, the indoor models on the left, um, with fluid, put them anywhere almost, um, powered through. They don't take air from the room uh, for combustion, it's all room sealed, but they can sit and cut. What do you call them? Oh, these as well. These are, I don't know what these are, but there's an inner gas word that's sealed in that. But in Australia, we've got, we've got very limited access to boilers, to, to natural, to gas boilers. We have Bosch, Bosch has three different types of water here, they're all condensing. It's come to the inner gas that they're here. And it's super effective, they've got a problem. There's a company called Cine, and they have a sign, and they have a Baxi, and there's a couple of others. So there's not that many uh, to choose from. And finally, the problem that we've got now is they're all large capacity, they're all 30 kilowatt plus. There's, there's a Bosch one that's 18 for a while, I believe they're bringing out the 12 kilowatt. But with fluid, with the internal one, that can go in the kitchen cupboard or the laundry cupboard, and we can flu that outside, so it throws out no heat whatsoever. We've got a large range of controls. Again, we have a reset control, so we can, we can uh, do weather compensation. Uh, there's an increasing range of outputs. We've got a 12 kilowatt range. They can't be used for cooling. Heat pipes, air source. They're more expensive to buy and install than natural gas boilers. They're quite efficient if designed correctly and installed correctly. They've got to be installed outside, not installed in inside. I don't suppose you put it in uh, The running cost can be offset by installing photovoltaic panels on the roof, which is probably the best way of running them now. And they can be used to heat radiators. The radiators have to be oversized because now we're not running 70 degree water through the, the system, we're actually running 40 degree water, so we have to oversize the radiator <coughs> to give it a bigger surface area. So we're getting the same heat output as we would from a small radiator at 70 degrees. They're ideal for radiant floor or ceiling or wall. Have you got an experience in ground source heat pumps or are these all air, air source? No, I've got a great deal of experience in ground source. Um, we have done one, uh, but uh, the ground part of it, the ground source part of it, was carried out by a specialist company. It's something that you can, if you did incorrectly, could be a large waste of money. Uh, so it does work, I believe, very well. We used to get regular contacts by architects wanting to know if we know anyone who 
to do the calculations on the uh, uh, on ground soil since nobody around Adelaide had much experience in maybe maybe ecology analysis. Have you heard of it recently in, uh, in Australia? Yeah, there's a company up there, there's a, a couple of companies around there. there's one in Sydney, they've got a, a guy up in the Adelaide Hills that does the calculations for ground soil. It, it's the ground is I think the key. It, it, some grounds hold more heat than others. Uh, so if you get the ground incorrect, um, <coughs> as I say, place the money back. Yeah, it's, it's a more of a specialist area. But uh, I could put you in touch. It can also provide, uh, provide domestic water by a storage tank and can be used for cooling. Here's an example of a ground source heat pump. Do we know how a ground source and air source are different? Yeah, yeah, so we're all good on that. Again, these are more expensive to buy and install. Um, running cost fee, again, and much the same as a, a air source heat pump. Um, but slightly more expensive. These are boiler. This is a fire bird deal boiler made in Ireland. They're cheaper than a heat pump. More expensive than a gas boiler. They're, they're very good. Condensing boiler, they're very efficient. They can provide domestic hot water. We've done a job up in the hills where he runs hot water in the, in the summer from that and radio panel radiators in the winter. And apparently, he can't tell the difference in the level of his diesel over the summer when he's just running hot water. Uh, it requires a diesel storage tank. It can be installed inside our, our app. They do do an internal model that's fluid externally. As well, like right. some of the pellet stones, you can run, you can use for grain and that. Yeah, well, to to be honest, we went to see in New Zealand, they had a lot of trouble because some guy tried to make his own pellets. <laughs> and um, well, that was all right. he, he, I think if I remember the story right, he put some kind of fish oil in it to <laughs> try it. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing all clogged up. <laughs> it, just, it just all clogged up. You, you want, 
<laughs> you want those oil drip burners? You put car oil in it and drip it. My brother did. I put the temperature up and clean it. Now, I don't know, some of the thermal systems, you guys are probably far more informed on solar systems than I am. But you're probably far. What's that? Uh, 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 I guess as, 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 as homes get better constructed and they get better insulated and, and, and air tightness gets better, um, there's, there's some call for now for solar thermal systems. The demand, I was reading something before I came out about the radiant floor heating not being very good for cooling homes because it can overheat the house. Because the insulation is so good, and the double glaze and triple glaze is so good that the radiant floor heating can overheat the house. So I'm guessing that, yeah, if you get a good solar system, um, maybe, maybe it will reduce running costs, but I would think the external cost can find the boost. Sorry. You reckon it's good? It, those tubes, there are 80 yeah. tubes per inch of power, 120 watts per meter how you calculate that from your screen. Exactly. Depends how you calculate that, where you are, the line, you know, something like that. But look, I've seen that on the three, uh, the three thermal issues, the three lot, and yeah. we're 50 degrees Celsius out there. Right. So I'll put a windshield crack over the bottom, so it's just a, it's a pretty harsh condition. That's what they'll have to calculate. Okay. So they're pretty big. The original tunes were built in six. Long, long, long. I've always shied away from people who say, oh, I want to run a solar thermal system because at the end of the day, I don't have enough experience with it. I can't think of where the installation is. And I don't have enough experience with it. These were developed, but the areas with flat lake were kind of the point. Right. right. And I was told, well, I wanted to understand that flat lake and flat lake collectors are actually better with lower temperatures. Which is what we're trying to put into our floors. The, the evacuated tubes give a better performance the higher up the scale you want. So, if you want domestic hot water at 60 degrees, the evacuated tubes have to be put out more, they better perform better. Whereas the flat plate will perform if you're running out of 140 or 145 degrees. So the bottom was had less tubes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the flat plate is just a bit empirical. Anyone that's ever worked on it's in the the bottom line with that had is it's a luminous glass. Yeah, sunlight. Okay. And a one-way track. The sunlight goes in, doesn't get back out, it's super insulated. Yeah. You can have snow in the yeah. right? and that thing will still give you 50 degrees Celsius in glass in a snowfall. But what about what about overall over the day? Per square inch on an average It's the same as calculating PV for photo, it depends on average sun hours, where you are, or trees around you, all the other areas. The biggest issue is that they overheat the sun. So yeah. Yeah. When you Look, scale all, it to the all solar hot waters do that too. And when, you, when you triple the size and you heat it in the winter, then you struggle. I sun disagree sun. because that comes down to engineering. And I personally disagree with the entire solar water market for that because they don't address that problem anymore. Mm -hmm. You're only just talking about some valve work and a little bit of trying to solve those problems. Yeah. I would rather have too much energy, personally, yeah, yeah. and that can manage it better. We, we've had other talkers who have been doing solar, and, and um, John Mason is one who's got it installed, and he's, he's having a boiling point. His system is overboiling, he's shading up, doing all sorts of stuff, trying to get rid It's of not that hard to address, so it's just that whoever designed it hasn't looked at it. Look, one company I know, uh, they're having that problem in Australia. And what they're doing is they're the same for customer get a small gauge tank and do the dump into that, that acts as a heat sink, and then they plot that back into a poly tank. Right? That's a very low tech answer. We work on a very high tech answer to address it. Uh, your big difference is like these tubes, there's a flooded type and there's a dry type. All right? The flooded type are uh, totally different to deal with than the dry type. The dry type, the heat in it, uh, the way that works, you can run that dry. So you can actually completely shut it down easily. Are you talking about drain that? Well, look, the one that runs a heat pipe is designed that it can't be uh, freeze broke. 
right? So no matter what, there's no good in it, there's nothing in the free that's man would shatter. It wouldn't work in a stick field under any condition, all right? Uh, the beauty of that system is we've played around and you can just drain the manifold. You have to. There's all kinds of ways. Uh, we didn't finish the belt again. We were going to, and the red tape issue with Australia is it's not. Uh, so we haven't disclosed it. There's, there's potentially a market for you. It's Everyone's got, spoken to it. But they're having issues with quality yeah. and shading it. So I know. And I just think that the, the companies that are doing the retailing haven't done that last little step. It's, it's letting everyone down. I don't like to see water being dumped in summer any more than anyone else does. Or over the it's not that hard. What we were actually doing is we were taking the excess and 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 the This is just the cost of the fuel through these various appliances to produce a thousand kilowatts of heat. So the heat uh, pump running. Is that kilowatt hours or kilo, I mean kilowatts is, a, is power? Yeah, kilowatt, kilowatt energy, energy into, into, kilowatt into water. Hour. Not kilowatt hours, just kilowatts. That's power. Kilowatt hours is energy. So what are you talking about? Power or energy? <laughs> energy, thermal energy. So that's kilowatt hours. Kilowatt hours. Kilowatt hours. We have $94 for the air source heat pump, that's a coefficient of 3.5. Uh, an LPG boiler, convincing boiler is $158. These are prices that I got yesterday uh, off the internet. Over what time period? Is that a quarter? No, it's just to produce that amount. Oh, it's it should be kilowatt hours. Oh, yeah, it doesn't have time. Uh, now, fuel up the Can I be nice to everybody here? Because I use so, uh, the solid wood sometimes if I'm not lazy. You can get it for free. Just get to know if any timber cutters. They have to dump it and they pay $60 a ton to dump it. You go and pick it up when they're cutting trees, you get it for nothing. You dry it out for two years. <coughs> Again, the geothermal, I haven't had a great deal of experience with. Um, I would imagine it's pretty, probably a little bit better. It would be better. But it's my own experience. Just this is guy there. Three years ago, we had a sustainable house in Burnside at ground source heat pump. Um, not, not ironic, and he felt it was about a third of the heat inside of the system, about half a point of the money for it. So it cost him close to 30 grand to put the ground source in. Yeah. So it's not how it is. Yeah. It's, sort of so it's, 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 it's usually expensive to put the ground source, as you say. There's a water for water one as well, you can run a street bag or pond. Yeah. See, water's, apparently, water is very good. Uh, for, for extractive heat. Uh, apparently boggy ground is very good. Apparently wet sand is very good. Apparently rock is very good. But dry sand or, you know, there's different areas and, and then you have to calculate the amount of tube you need in the ground. And, and that's where the expense comes, to put in the tubing in the ground. If you did not want to use water, what do you recommend? What, for a ground source heat? No, no for any of the system. Uh, no, uh, I think water's the only, the only thing we could put in the hunting system that, that would work very well. Are you using any anti-corrosive agents? Yeah, the we're the throwing an inhibitor, corrosion inhibitor, uh, that doesn't lubricate much of that. Uh, and it gives it some anti-freeze properties, not as immediately. It also can be anti-oil properties. 
Sorry? Does it give you any cause of this? Um, no, I guess it would to some extent, yeah, but um, there are a lot of um, controls on these new appliances that come in. No point, you shouldn't be living that in there, those pipes in there. No, <coughs> you can control the storage tank. It's not like it's in tanks or any of that. So it's not meant for the end of this project. Now, we have done on the push. Very close. Installations now with cooling, um, they were designed with that in mind before we installed the radiant floor system. And um, what I mean by that is that the architect actually designed a system where he had high level vents at one end of the house and low level vents at the other end of the house. And in the evening, the air just moved through the building and lifted all the cool air off the floor. It worked very well, it's been working for the last Three years now, two and a half years, uh, it's had two sons, uh, the one system in the Piccadilly, and it's worked very well. It's all tiled floor, and there's no carpets, and it's just all it's on an insulated bed. It's polystyrene and factory sheet on top of a slab, and then pipe work on top of that, and uh, they did pour another slab, and the concrete guys actually poured the other slab, and then it was tiled. It's run by two daily heat pumps. And apparently it's very efficient. Um, the guy who owns the house would be quick to let us know it, would, it, was, it wasn't efficient, but it works very well. The day we turned it on, um, it's a house with three, three galleries as such. It's, it's three long uh, buildings linked by a, a glass gallery. And in the gallery, when the day we turned it on, it was a 35 degree day outside. And I put my thermal camera on the floor um, before we turned the system on. <laughs> it was 35 degrees and the sun was just coming around. The floor temperature was 35. We went and had some lunch. When we came back, the system had been running for about an hour and a half. The floor was 22 degrees. He reckons in the hottest period last year, the house got to, the air temperature in the house got to about 24 at the end of that long hot week. So, it does work quite well. It has to be designed. The house has to be designed with the cooling in mind, that the floor's being cooled. Uh, but, yeah, there's another one up in Angerston. I have an earnest. How's that one going? Yep, yeah, not heard anything from it. That's on the timber floor. Now, the guy, that, the house there wasn't designed to run the floor cooling. In fact, we finished the job, and just as we were about to fire it up, the guy said, Can I cool with this? Said, yeah, actually, why not? <laughs> so we did a bit of a modification on the, on the heat pump and lo and behold, he calls with it now. And as Ian said, we've not heard anything from him. So obviously, it works quite well. It's a timber, timber floor on, on Hebel Bluff. It's, uh, it's been raised off the floor and it's, it's been working quite well. But it does, if you can design or your architect can design the, system, the, the building to take advantage of this. I don't see why it can't work very well. The um, Bangkok International Airport is a good range of floor cooling. So, um, if you just go on the website and look at that, it, it does work very well. So, when you're talking about cooling, you're just talking about uh, water at a low temperature. So, not chilled water. Is there a caution against using chilled water in, uh, in slab? Maybe not the slab, but you can get condensation on the surface. Um, but there are controls now that are humidity controls that will shut the system down or increase the water temperature if that is, is likely to happen. I 
think we're quite lucky here in Adelaide that we've got a very dry mm. summer. I don't think it would work very well in Queensland. Uh, but it, we've got, I think we've got the opportunity here in Adelaide because of our dry summers to maybe take advantage of this dual role that radiant floor can play, maybe radiant floor heating and cooling, or radiant ceiling cooling, for instance. So, yeah, I think we need to maybe explore that a little bit more. Now, retrofitting. Obviously, retrofitting <coughs> radiators is fairly simple. These guys from England would know we don't care, we'll just put the pipes down the walls and we hook them up to the radiator and we're happy. But Australians aren't <laughs> that happy with pipes down the walls, so they end up chasing the minimum, which makes uh, retrofitting to some properties a little bit harder. But a lot of the old Adelaide type houses have a fair bit of ground space underneath. They're built on piers and walls, and you can get under there. And we've just recently done one on Steve's, done one there, and we all got under there. <coughs> I didn't get under there, Steve. Um, and, and the pipe yeah. just pops up through the floor, and, and the radiator sitting in rooms, and it works really well. So, yeah, retrofitting is quite good. There are products now available, such as this product from a company called Tamolia in, in England where you can sit it on top of an existing slab or on, on top of an existing timber floor. Now I'm going to ask Mike here, <coughs> Mike, one of your ATA members, is actually doing this. I didn't realise and then I got hooked into maybe hooking up his heat pump. But Mike's investigated a system that he imported himself from England, uh, similar to this, uh, and he's going to fit it on top of his timber floor and then timber over the top of it, eh? Do you want to say a bit about it? Oh, yeah. Um, I'd like to be able to tell you that it works really well. And unfortunately, the whole kit sitting down in a warehouse down in Port Adelaide, waiting, waiting for us to get on to the delivery process. Um, it's actually from another company called Waven, who are a multinational company that specialise in plastic pipes, I think, for everything that you fit in. So, from sewage to water to telecom lines, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the outfit we're dealing with is, a, is their uh, UK company called HEP2O. -E so if you go on Google and search for that, you'll find it. And they do uh, plumbing and underfloor heat. What we've actually bought is a, well, what we've bought really is the design of um, 13 zones in our house uh, onto which we are fitting. Uh, 30, 35 mil polystyrene sheets that are 400 mil long by 400 mil wide, no, 600 mil wide, uh, already with channels cut in them uh, for the pipe to be just laid in. On top of that, there's a very thin uh, foil topping that acts as the radiator to uh, spread the heat. Uh, we're actually looking for uh, both the heating and the cooling. Um, uh, this is one aspect of us making our house comfortable. It's a 65, mid 60 brick veneer, current, <coughs> got no insulation in the walls, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's up at Blackwood, so my wife and I both build the top. So we're pulling off all the plasterboard and insulating. We are um, putting in um, double glazed windows. In fact, we're taking the roof off and having a sort of roof out to the north. Uh, double glazing, retrofit, double glazing to the existing windows, the underfloor heating, and that's th those three components, I guess, are what we're expecting to make a very comfortable house. Uh, we, we, we found Len when um, I rang up Dakin to uh, ask him to size a heat pump, a reverse cycle heat pump, to um, power this, I guess, um, the heater, uh, the cooler, and um, you got the impression straight away that they had no idea what to, what to say, but fortunately they came back and recommended the link. So we've taken it from there, and what about three weeks ago, we put the put the um, feed-in pipes under the slab on the new area that we're going to enclose. Uh, that Len has done. That's just as that pipe that he was describing before with the. The, what, sorry, the aluminium tube. Oh, uh, it's a yeah, polyethylene cross pipe with an aluminium <laughs> tube in it. just gives it a bit of rigidity. There are going to be problems with um, Mike's system, and he knows that. You, you obviously put in uh, another 
stacking some top of your existing timber floors, so we've got floor levels to think about, skirting levels. But it's a big project, and Mike had done all this before I met him, and he organised all this through waving. And there's a wave in Asia now, I believe, there's a, a rep in Asia. Um, but yeah, systems are out there to address those things. Mail uh, and systems. Panel have always been the In fact, most of the council houses in England don't have radiator systems and do retrofit. Most of our work is all in place. This is just recommendations. Check the advice in a couple of years, natural gas boilers outside, if they're not in a dusty area. Two years to be good. Uh, much than otherwise. Check the blue gases, make sure it's burning correctly. Check up, check the system and top up with the system immediately. Make sure that's working. If you don't need it too much. Um, and then radiator systems, uh, again, they're getting more common now. Um, in the UK, we used to have a black sludge and used to be employed doing. These sludges, the sludge collects in the middle of the radiator and then the radiator doesn't work very efficiently. There are now magnetic filters out there that will collect this, this ferrous sludge because the bench steel radiator is a bunch around the system. Once they're checked, once a year and clean. <coughs> really not a great deal of maintenance. The, the beauty of hydraulic systems is generally the equipment outside. It's not tucked away in a weak space, it's, it's out where we can get at it. Maintain it easily, maintain it quickly. Um, the floor system really doesn't need any maintenance whatsoever. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty simple systems to maintain and, and keep, keep operating. The boilers tend to have a little bit of a glitch every, every winter when you buy a mountain pump stick. And the boiler doesn't want to get done. But they need to just make it and solve that. They lubricate the pumps when you come to keep it up. I think that's the last one. Here we go. Did you just explain the means of having the uh, under the slab? Under the slab. Yeah. Oh, in the slab. Yeah. In the rather, slab. Rather than on, on, on top of the suite. It's just we've got the, you have additional heat loss to the ground. Because we've now got that differential in temperature between your slab and the ground underneath the grade, you're going to get heat transfer. And, and it can be quite large depending on the ground. Again, going back to the geothermal, that some of some grounds are better at absorbing heat than others. If you're on a very wet, you know, this is a good example. Ian and I um, were called into a job um, up in the hills. They built a straw house out of straw bales. It was a lovely house, and it was on a lovely big uh, bit of land. And they put in a wood combustion stove, and another installer put in the, um, the underfloor heating. And we hooked up the wood combustion stove. And the first year we went up there, it worked really, really well. You're smiling here, you know this guy. <laughs> um, the first year it worked really well, and, and it was great. The second year we got a call and they said, the floor's not very hot. It's really cold. Uh, so we went up there, the fire was roaring, pumps were working, everything was going really well. And we thought, what's going on? You can't understand it. The floor, although it wasn't cold, it wasn't as hot as it should be. So we're standing there, and a the lady made us a cup of coffee, and she, she was a geologist, and she, she is a geologist for the government. So she made us a cup of coffee, and we're standing at the back door looking out, drinking my coffee, and we're thinking about this, and Ian's coming up. And as I looked out the back door, the ground went up. And then I walked to the other side of the house, and the ground went down to a dam. And I said, have you had a lot of rain recently? And the lady said, I know what you're going to say. I said, what's that? She said, the water's taking the heat in. I said, yeah, the water's running under your house. It's whipping all the heat down into the dam. And, and that's what happens. You will lose heat to the ground. And the wetter the ground, you will lose more heat. Any more questions? Rather than having a hydraulic system, do you also install just straight electrical feeding systems in the floor? I don't. Is that more expensive or, or cheaper? No, or it, it is slightly more expensive. Slightly more expensive to run, but there's some argument in having <coughs> maybe electric floor in the in bathrooms or the wet areas, and hydraulics in the rest of the house. Uh, it's more controllable, and you can switch it on 
times like this when it's not that cold out, but you still want that warmth in your bathroom. So yeah, there's some argument for that. But is it more expensive to run? It? it is more expensive to run. What about installation costs for the for both systems? It's like, yeah, they're slightly more expensive installation costs. And what are installation costs typically for an electric one? Or for both systems? I don't know about electric. Uh, hydraulic systems typically run at about fifty dollars a square meter to the distribution manifold. So for your that's generally over 100 square meters. Under 100 square meters, it's probably slightly higher. But that goes to the distribution manifold. And these are sort of just figures thrown out there. But that's the sort of the run of it. From the distribution manifold, the heat source generally dictates the rest of the cost. So if you're having a natural gas boiler, for instance, it could be a couple of thousand, maybe $3,000 on top. But if you're going for a heat pump, you could pay up to ten thousand dollars. So it's really down it, the, the floor part of it is a, more or less a fixed fee or a figure, but it's the heat source after that, and you can try. Earlier on, you were talking about uh, ground source heat pumps, and um, I was just wondering what the cost of that is Yeah, so it's not really a ground source, like. No, it's a wood, yeah. But apparently that works really well. Um, and it's cheaper than what's set up in the ground for ground deposit. Have you seen any of them in Australia? I haven't seen any, no. But going, I mean, with ground source, as I understand ground sources, the, 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 the ground gets charged by the sun. So the water, because we've got high specific heat capacity of water, if, if the ground's sodden, then it will contain more heat energy. And so, better as well. Yeah, so and it will charge from the surroundings. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, for the later time, you're just chucking a big pot, the soil is probably five hundred meters from the dams, it's easy. You don't have to go to sort of break big holes in the ground. Yeah, it could and work. It's cheap, so it's cheap and easy, and you've got a high heat capacity source there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it, could, it could work quite well. Yeah. You might have to get some specialist advice on it, but. Yeah, yeah, it could work quite well. Well, it's just worth getting a bit of wear on it because anyone wants to do one of those drive regularly. Yeah, they've got the dams. That's what we're talking about. I don't know yeah. the dams. Yeah. <laughs> so, if anyone of you knows of anyone, we'd love to speak to them. We're going to do exactly that. Yeah. 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 I've got the farms, yeah. farms yeah. and that with a lot of land, and they yeah. usually yeah. always have some sort of dams. It has to be, it has to be at least two metres deep. Yeah. Uh, all oh, year round. It has to be a decent size body of water. Yeah, it does have to be a decent size. And you're talking about extracting that heat. It, it, it's sort of looking at the dam's batch, yeah. and, you, and you're taking the heat from that batch. And the only way it can recharge is through the sun. And, and also, the, the amount of heat you can take out is dependent on the surface area of the plant you put in, and, and the flow rates through it. So if, you, if you've got a small surface area and large flow rates, then you know, you're back to almost the temperatures of air source. So it, it has to be calculated correctly. And, and there are people out there that can do it. And, Okay. What is the price of conventional set up a system for using this small motion for a couple of years? Yeah, you can. Yeah. And yeah, the, uh, so the floor system and now the natural gas board. In, in the time that I've been here, natural gas boilers have come down hugely. Uh, so they're very expensive. But now they've got to be done. Is it some sort of pricing for retrofit or for a new one? Yeah, probably for a new fit. Not on slab, that would probably be slightly more expensive because of the, the insulation. And then again, you've got to put on another screed cover. So you've got that to take into consideration. But in slab, yeah, you're probably looking at that sort of price. Yeah, but the retrofit is more expensive than the cost of the one that one is. Yeah. Do you use a 5,000 tape wood instead of a deck? No. Uh, how long to rehab warranty the pipe? Four to five years. But it'll last it won't last. Yeah, I mean it's encased in copper. And it can spare the rate expansion, there's no so it'll last five years. Really it depends where you put the heat up. Um, I mean on the beach, I don't think they last very long. But I can tell you maybe that they last a good twenty years. Yeah.
How much do the pipes cost per 100 metres of the meter or whatever, a roll of pipes? I don't know if Steve will tell you that because he's a supplier. What's a, what's a roll of rehab, Steve? 200 metre roll. Um, Talk, well, the major roll. Thank you, Len. I think an excellent talk. We can uh, all put our hands together for Len. <laughs> 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 Hydronic three-page article in the Blade Sanctuary magazine, which talks a lot about what Len's talked about and um, some other bits and pieces. Which I have that. You can have that. <laughs> we should have got that before. And a bottle of uh, <laughs> some of the wine for you. Thank so, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you're a new member to the ACA or you've never been to one of our meetings, Catherine will be standing up out the back there. We'll give you a free magazine. She's got bunches of sanctuaries and renewed magazines. Uh, we normally have a Q&A session now, so if anybody's got any questions they'd like to ask, then fire away. You can ask somebody in the audience if you've got a problem.